Maria Teresa Kumar, seated to my left, is the founding executive director of Voto Latino, an organization that, that, that all of you know. Uh, Poder Magazine named her as one of the 20 most notable U.S. Hispanics under 40, and Hispanic Magazine listed her among the leading Latino voices in government and politics. Last year, Washington Life Magazine placed Maria Teresa on the cover of their issue, highlighting the most influential, Washing influential Washingtonians under 40. But today, you don't need to buy a magazine to hear why, because she's here with us, and she's going to let us know. Oh dear, that is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, she is also the recipient of numerous leadership awards, including from the White House Project, the Amahan Foundation, and the New York Legislature. Maria Teresa received her master's degree in public <coughs> policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and she has a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of California at Davis. I came to this country when I was four years old from Colombia, and my family and I we were fleeing what a lot of folks during that time was, poverty, war, and economic d disparity. And we ended up in a small town called Sonoma, California. You can imagine my mother's chagrin coming from a metropolitan of Bogota of seven million people at the time to all of a sudden a town of 3,000. So <laughs> it was rural. I don't think my mother had ever seen a plant before in her life. And all of a sudden she, was, she became a farm worker. Um, and that was her, her story and our experience. And fast forward to 25 years later, I became an accidental advocate, uh, being the co-founder of Voto Latino and falling passionately in love with the idea of trying to integrate American Latino youth. So focusing on the children of these immigrants into the, into the American fabric as quickly as possible, but also planting the seed of they're proud to be Latino, they're also proud to be American, and as we grow as a country, what are our challenges? And as many of you know, the census figures just recently came out, and surprise to everybody <coughs> but Latinos, Apparently, there's 50 million of us in this country. We're the third largest Latino community in the Americas. <coughs> Brazil being number one, Mexico being number two, the US being number three. When we talk about emerging markets, this is one of the largest emerging markets within our borders. And when we start looking at, and it's, it's exciting, and it's exciting because it's neg often neglected. And when we start looking at diaspora communities, what does that mean? We often forget, number one, that 60% of American of Latinos are actually U.S. born. So when we start looking at that swath of individuals and the remittances that our families have paid back to Latin America and really help bring forth whole economies, whether it's the Dominican Republic, whether it's El Salvador, whether it's Mexico, and the list goes on, this is a generation that unless we know where that remittance is going, and that we're strengthening those countries smartly so that basically we're not sustaining communities paycheck by paycheck, but we're actually investing in infrastructure and education, healthcare, and schools. What's going to happen when my parents' generation is no longer supporting Latin America through their remittance payments? Those are real questions. And so how can we work together within the diaspora community here and with <coughs> folks in the recipient countries to ensure that we are building those infrastructures and thinking long term. When we think of immigration, we also have to think smartly because it's a reality that is not just an immigration across borders, but it's also a reality that a lot of folks are going, there's a reverse migration, specifically given the economic par my, uh, climate that we see today. Brazil is a perfect example. And oftentimes when we think of diaspora communities, and I think, Teddy, you touched upon it, we forget about the resources that we can learn from the home countries. Again, I point to Brazil. Brazil has, tri has figured out what we keep saying that we want to, which is how do we make sure that we have energy efficient policy? A country that's a quarter of ours 30 years ago <coughs> made sure in the 1970s they saw the ga gas prices go up, they saw the cost of oil, of oil go up, and there was no question in their mind that they had to change the way they consumed energy. <coughs> we were two at the table and we chose not to. So what are those experiences from Latin America that we can learn and apply to our constituency here? And how can we bring in businesses from Latin America back to the United States and take advantage of the 50 million plus? It's a trillion, it's a trillion dollar purchasing power that this community has within our borders. But we're missing the boat. We keep examining them as one foreigners, but we're not experiencing them as Americans, but also bicultural. We keep talking about India and China going to Latin America, creating great smart free trade agreements. But there's a culture there that China's never going to be able to overcome. Very difficult. We have the opportunity here. 
because one of the most, and I'm sure folks in this room understand, one of the most difficult things that you can teach someone, you can teach them language, but very difficult to teach them culture yes. and how to yeah, operate right. beyond, and how to, beyond, how to operate beyond borders. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that we're educating the population here? Sadly enough, the Latino community is dropping out in record numbers, but the, half the equation people say, well, they're dropping out, but they're dropping out because they're helping support their families. They're dropping out to work. So how do we actually start looking at education slightly different in this country, whether it's vocational training or what have you, ensure that we're actually taking advantage of their biculturalism, their bilingualism, and at the end of the day, their spirit that they believe deeply in America, that they'd like to be able to sprout into other countries and other borders. China and India both have a billion plus people. When you look at our neighbors of the Latin American hemisphere, that's a million, dollar, million person marketplace as well. We have an opportunity, and I think as, as we talk about diaspora, we should look increasingly, how do we make sure that we're strengthening ourselves within the United States, but also taking advantage of what, the resources that we have to make sure that we can continue to be competitive in Latin America. One of the things that, um, very briefly in some of the work that I've done, text messaging is one of the fastest ways that we communicate, not you know, only within our border, but with family members outside of it. And it's incredible the opportunity that we have. When there were earthquakes in Mexico, I knew about it before I turned on the television. When you, there was uprising in, in Honduras, ditto. It was all text messaging. It's an incredible network. How can we start using that network so that people can start talking about human trafficking that we see across our borders. I can tell you that I can go into my small town of Sonoma. Everybody knows who's, everybody already knows those networks. They know who are the people that are human trafficking. They know the people that are basically passing drugs. They know the people who are taking advantage of women and children. But we're not taking advantage of it because we still see them, unfortunately, these individuals, these new communities, more as a burden than an opportunity for our law, law enforcement. And that's a conversation I think that we could also explore. It's like, how can we actually use these loose networks through text messaging, through what have you? They know what's happening across the border and within their communities. And how do we actually help that as a value? And I can continue, but that was just uh, something to pause on. Thank you so much, Aaron, again. Thank you.